Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. When I was a youngster growing up in the 1990s and my parents realised that I had a serious interest in paleontology and dinosaurs, they spent quite a lot of time and money on finding various research materials for me. They bought me books, magazines and articles, anything that they could find that would further stimulate my interest in this subject. However, of everything they got for me, one magazine series sticks out in my mind. It was called Dinosaur, with an exclamation mark, and was really my first real insight into the world of paleontology. While some of the other books and articles that I had access to were more aimed at a purely childlike sort of an audience, these were quite scientifically detailed in that they would give you phylogenetic trees, detailed background information about the different groups of dinosaurs and how they were all related to one another, and I found it genuinely fascinating. But of all of the ad many editions that I actually owned of this magazine series, there's one in particular that sticks in my memory, and that was edition 66. And the reason for this is because one section of the book dealt with speculative evolution. As a youngster, I had no idea what that word actually meant, but when I read this certain section of this magazine, I was spellbound, and I couldn't keep my eyes off this page. An author, by the name of Dougal Dixon, had provided illustrations of various types of modern-day dinosaurs, and he postulated what the world would be like had these animals survived the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago. I was hooked. When I was slightly older, during my teenage years, I had completely forgotten about the speculative evolution aspect of these magazines, and Dougal Dixon's works were completely lost, reduced to a tiny, tiny stored part of my memory. However, I discovered another project that proved equally as fascinating and was even more detailed than anything that Dixon had produced, and it was called the new dinosaurs. When I actually checked who had produced the new dinosaurs by looking further than the pictures I encountered online, I found some very familiar images and I realised that there was actually a book based on these old illustrations from the magazines I had read in the 90s and it was by this same guy, Dougal Dixon. And I was astounded and I bought the book with the money that I had saved up from a part-time job at the time and I devoured it eagerly, to think there was actually a whole published book out there. I'd always assumed this was just a one-off edition from this magazine series. I had no idea it would carry on into the future like this. Then, a few years later, I happened to discover, by chance, a website on the internet called The Speculative Dinosaur Project. And from that time on, my mind was blown once again. It was so fascinating to see how much detail, time and effort had gone into this project, and the dinosaurs and other animals they created were both highly plausible and well-researched. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, a couple of years ago, I started to create my own speculative evolution project, based on the same sort of ideas as Dixon's work and the speculative dinosaur project. My project is known as Alter Earth, and it takes place in a parallel universe directly set against our own world, where the Chicxulub impact never occurred, and non-avian dinosaurs survive to the present day. My ultimate aim is to create an incredibly detailed world, focusing on all lineages of tetrapods that made it to the present day, and how they differ and bear some similarities to those animals alive in our own timeline today. I'd like to give you a quick overview of my work, with a short section about the late Cretaceous extinction event. I'll now read out a short section from my work, detailing the animals that survived and made it into the Paleocene. I hope you find it interesting, and leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you like what you hear and want to see some more. The late Maastrichtian period. Montana, USA, 66 million years ago. Sea levels have been falling steadily for millions of years. 
the great interior seaway of North America has almost completely dried up, and the whole northern hemisphere has been connected by land bridges. Dinosaurs migrate to new lands and bring with them new diseases. The falling sea levels have also exacerbated climatic changes, partly by disrupting winds and ocean currents, and partly by reducing the Earth's albedo, and therefore increasing global temperatures. Marine biodiversity drops significantly as a result. The dominant oceanic predators, giant aquatic relatives of monitor lizards known as mosasaurs, are down to a handful of species. A more ancient group of marine reptiles, the plesiosaurs, are also still hanging on. Large flightless birds known as hesperornithids swim in flocks and congregate on sandy beaches to lay their eggs. In Montana, terrestrial life is also under threat. The North American dinosaurs are under a period of great stress. As the dominant form of life, they suffer the most from the turmoil. Species numbers plummet to dangerously low levels. Where there were once half a dozen horned ceratopsians, now there is only one chasmosaurian, the famous Triceratops. Although Triceratops is the only member of its family in Western North America, it is an extremely common animal. About 40% of all dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation belong to this one genus. Alongside this well-known giant lived a much smaller and more primitive cousin, the pig-sized Leptoceratops. However, many dinosaurs of this time are giants. A large hadrosaur, Edmontosaurus, is also the last representative of its group in the region. The mighty Tyrannosaurus is similarly the largest and last of its kind in North America. Like Triceratops, T. rex has a rather large distribution and is the most common predatory dinosaur at this time. Dominance of these single genera, in place of the greater diversity of the Campanian stage about 10 million years earlier, seems to indicate that these dinosaurs are moving into vacated niches left empty by extinction events. However, not all animals are fortunate enough to be so numerous. The armoured ankylosaurs are represented by two forms, the massive Ankylosaurus and the smaller Denvasaurus. These animals are very rare, only making up about 1% of the total large dinosaurs in their ecosystems. In a similar position are the dome-headed Pachycephalosaurs, who have always been a relatively modest group. Another unassuming herbivore, Thessalosaurus, is probably the cutest of these dinosaurs, with its fairly small size, slightly tubby body, and its propensity to dive into water at the first sign of danger. Aside from the tyrannosaurs, theropods are relatively scarce. The speedy ornithomimosaurs, Struthiomimus and Ornithomimus, have made it thus far, the former genus having survived for a quite impressive 10 million years. This points to the animal having a broad, generalist diet, which allowed it to survive the climatic upheavals rather well. An array of other theropod dinosaurs are also present, including the large oviraptorosaur Anzu and its smaller relative Leptorhynchus. These extremely bird-like creatures are omnivores, capable of eating pretty much anything that they can swallow. More exclusively predatory animals, such as the sickle-clawed dromaeosaurs Acoraptor and Dakotaraptor, lurk in the undergrowth ready to pounce on unsuspecting prey. At night, the stealthy troodontids emerge to hunt small animals and, on the odd occasion, feed on fruit and leaves to supplement their diet. In the skies above, the giant Asdarkid pterosaur Quetzalcoatlus soars on an 11 metre wingspan searching for a suitable place to land and begins scouring the ground for small prey. It is quite the sight to see these towering, giraffe-sized creatures prowling about at dusk like something from a dark fever dream. Joining these imposing animals in the air are a number of bird species, some of which are close relatives of modern birds. A real standout of the avifauna of this time has to be Avisaurus, a rather surreal predator that combines a rather familiar bird body, at least on the surface, with a toothy, dinosaur-like snout. Avisaurus is also the largest bird in this ecosystem, with a wingspan of up to 1.5 metres. Mammals are present in large numbers, 
although the vast majority are small, shrew-like animals. Metatherians, that is to say the relatives of modern marsupials, are common, as are the rodent-like multituberculates. Eutherians, relatives of most modern mammals, are somewhat rarer. An exception to the rule of midget mammals is the cat-sized metatherian Didelphodon, equipped with crushing molars and with adaptations for a predatory lifestyle. Unbeknownst to the dinosaurs and other animals, there is an even greater danger approaching. An asteroid the size of Mount Everest is screeching through the solar system, initially appearing as a bright speck of light in the night sky, with each passing day it grows in size until the asteroid is clearly visible even during the middle of the day. The dinosaurs and other animals continue their daily routines, completely oblivious of the potential cataclysm on the horizon. Showers of shooting stars light up the night sky, harbingers of impending doom. The asteroid now appears like a second sun as it hurtles closer and closer towards the Earth. The world seems to take in a deep breath before the imminent strike. But nothing happens. The asteroid has veered off course, fading back into the void from which it came. For the inhabitants of the land below, a great tragedy has just been averted by a hair's width. Of course, the animals themselves don't have any idea of just how lucky they are. They may have gone through tough times, but the dinosaurs have come out on the other side, alive, but certainly not unscathed. I hope you liked this video. Leave a comment, like and subscribe, and I hope to see you again soon. Cheerio.